Okay, we are now at chapter 8 of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. And here is where I really want you guys to keep track of all the locations and names. This chapter especially, there are so many different people who come in and out of the, the story and into Frederick Douglass' life. So please, please, in your oh, excuse me, active reading guide, um, be as detailed as you can with the places and people in this one. Because what happens at the beginning is his master dies, right? Um, and a horrible, horrible thing happens in the first chapter is now that, you know, um, his master has died uh, and they needed to divide his property amongst his children. And look at what it says in the middle here. I was immediately sent for, in the middle of the chapter here, I was immediately sent for to be valued with the other property. He's he's being, um, he's being, uh, what's the word? He's, uh, what's the word when you when you get a, a value of something? Um, shoot, it starts with an A. Basically, he's being evaluated for how much worth he has. Um, what's the word? There's a word for it. He's being, uh, 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 I'll find the word and I'll, I'll remember it eventually. But anyway, he, he's just like the rest of the property. They're determining, you know, how much he's worth. And so they start to, um, divvy up the property. And he says here again, here again, my feelings rose up in de detestation of slavery. I had now a new conception of my degraded condition. He's realizing that he's he's just being treated like like property, and he, he's not even a, a human. He, and so this continues the theme of dehumanization, as we saw. Remember, like with pigs, horses, and now he's just like he's like a bookshelf. Hey, it's crazy. And uh, in the next paragraph, you, you see that they all kind of line up. They're all being eva uh, valued um, and, and checked to see um, how much they're worth. Horses and men, cattle and women, pigs and children, all holding the same rank in the scale of being. And we're all subjected to the same narrow examination. It's brutalizing. And it's not just brutalizing to the slave, but it's brutalizing to the slaveholder as well, because they view the slave as anything less than human as well. And then there's the division. He's he's scared because he doesn't know if he'll go to a good owner, especially Master Andrew. Um, and look at this theme here that comes up consistently. He was a common drunkard. There's that theme. Remember the most... Um, uh, torturous ones were often the ones who drank a lot and so there's this kind of uh, clear um, connection between alcohol and brutality that Frederick Douglass is making here um, it's not the first time as well so take note of that as well and he's like oh man I don't know if I'll, I'll make it if I get into his hands because I was, uh, and think about up into his life now, he's like a, a young teenager, maybe 10, 11, 12. He wasn't really treated so poorly growing up. But his other slaves, you know, they their back had been made familiar with the bloody lash so that they had become callous. Mine was so yet tender. He didn't wh get whipped too much. He wasn't beat too much. He, I mean, he had a good, good master, good mistress, you know. And he's worried that he'll be with uh, someone who is uh, is mean and, and, and brutal. But thankfully, he goes to Mrs. Lucretia and gets sent back to Baltimore to live with Master Hugh. Um, so kind of going back to his old situation. And um, yeah, and it continues. But the sad part here is this paragraph, then, his grandmother. You know, his grandmother was, as it says here, the source of all his wealth because she's the one who gave birth to a lot of his slaves. And uh, remember that idea that if uh, a slave gave birth to someone, that slave was automatically uh, a slave of the slaveholder. And so oftentimes masters would, you know, rape and sleep with their slaves to build up their, their, uh, their wealth. Uh, and so... 
this grandmother who had you know been with his his master attended him in childhood served him through life and at his death wiped from his icy brow the cold death sweat and closed his life forever she was just this wonderful slave who'd been there for forever what it sounds like nevertheless was a slave and when it came to her uh, end of her death you know she was just basically put off into the woods they built her as it says here a little hut and made her have to support herself out there in the middle of nowhere when she became of no value and it's just so sad because these slaves you know they weren't taken care of there was no retirement plan for them and so once they stopped being useful to the master they were just sent to pretty much die and this poem just kind of encapsulate the the pain and and uh, just the the intensity that the slaves feel from this whole situation and this paragraph too after is just so so hard to to read just because it's so so painful to see what it's like to be a slave at this time and then it gets to um towards the end you know, Master Thomas marries a second wife, and now he's, uh, where is it, he, Brandy, the influence of Brandy upon him. So again, that theme of alcohol and how it affects somebody as well. And, uh, you know, it's just, now he's being sent from Baltimore to St. Michael's. Um, keep that pat, that place in mind as well. And as he continues on in his journey, he's realizing that the only course of action from him is to escape slavery. And so at the end of chapter 8 here, he's resolved to run away uh, at the first sight he gets. And he kind of regrets not having taken those two gentlemen's um, um, request to run away. And he's, he's vowing not to make that mistake again and try to escape as soon as he can.